Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Moira Leng. She is the founder and medical director of an international palliative care trust in the UK called the CARDIS. Uh, she's a fellow of the University of Edinburgh of the Global Health Academy, and she wears so many hats that it's difficult to kind of uh, bring out a list of those. But more than everything, I think she is a great friend and colleague, a mentor for many, including me in India and Kerala. So welcome, Moira. Moira, I think we're going to have a discussion about palliative care and its meaning, especially, and how it has made a difference in all our lives and especially in communities that we work in. So since you have had uh, such a varied experience, you know, like probably one of the richest experience that a person can have. You have worked probably in so many countries. Um, can you give me some, us some valuable insights of how palliative care has grown? Uh, what are the insights that you have gained and you would want to share with us regarding palliative care? Thank you. Thank you, Chitra. It's, it's, it's just lovely to be here discussing these issues, as I think we have done for more than, than two decades. It's been fascinating watching, I think I've been involved now for more than three decades in palliative care, four different continents, and the ingredients, if you like, are similar in different settings. What has happened is it's kind of moved from something quite new, pioneering, into being more settled, more integrated into different uh, different places, different countries. And what I'm seeing is it, it, it works best if we do just what you said. If we have, some, we recognize that it's something that needs to be connected deeply uh, to individuals, individuals affected by palliative care need, individuals who are offering palliative care need, but actually they together form communities. And if we can connect with meaning and hope and values and what we're going to say about the most marginalized in our community, so our core humanity, then I think palliative care begins to make sense. If we see it simply as a medical specialty, it stays in the hospital setting, in the medical setting. Um, Kerala, I think, has been one of the places which pioneered a different way of looking at it and looking at it from the perspective of the community, from the perspective of those affected by it. Um, and I think you and I have talked about this before, about We've talked about how this is everybody's business. Yes. Um, and I think different parts of the world give us insights as to what that can mean in their setting. Yeah. So can you draw some parallels in terms of what's happening in Kerala in the palliative care scene and your other experiences? Yeah. They say modern palliative care started in the 60s. Of course, this is as old as people themselves. People have lived, people have died, and people have needed support through that time. What I think we saw initially was perhaps models that were um, developed from settings such as the UK, where maybe it, it had its basis in the charitable sector, in uh, the healthcare sector. But what we saw in Kerala and also Uganda, where I've spent a lot of time, but let me think of Kerala in particular, is a, a connecting of the medical model into the community. So what does this mean for the bus driver? What does this mean for the student in campus? Um, what does this mean for um, the common man? I think that's a phrase that, that is, means a lot here in Kerala. I'll give you an example. I arrived in uh, Cochin Airport the other day. I've been coming for more than 20 years with the visas, with the discussions at immigration. This time, the immigration officer said, you have a conference visa, can I check? And he said, what is the conference about? I said, palliative care. His face just cleared. He said, palliative care, no problem. So in Kerala, you have the immigration officer knowing what palliative care is. I remember meeting bus drivers up in Malipuram district, and every single time the bus driver and the bus conductor, they put, I think, was it one rupee at the yeah. time for every journey for palliative care. I think that is the strength that came from here, is everybody's business. And then each section of society decided how they were going to be involved. Yeah. I think that palliative care, I mean, like you said, it is not confined only you know, to the medical world in terms of, you know, like uh, it's a medical specialty. Of course, we have a role as a doctor, as, as medical professionals, as healthcare professionals to take care of people who need palliative care. That is probably one of the most important sections of palliative care. But I believe that palliative care as a philosophy mm -hmm. uh, has much more relevance mm -hmm. in uh, uh, the dimensions of uh, people's lives or in communities. What do you think about that? 
you're right to call it a philosophy, and in that philosophy you have many different models, many different ways it connects, for sure. You know, at the core of everything we do are our values. And the values that are distilled out in palliative care, because it deals with such crucial issues, such crucial times in our lives, it makes us uh, reflect on and maybe even challenge and develop our values. Um, and I think we've seen this in these last few years with the, the pressures of a pandemic. We've seen it in Kerala with the, the floods and, and the pressures and, and challenges that came from that and different parts of the world, different ways. But it brings us back to what's important. What gives our life meaning? And what do we really want at times when we're ill, when we're suffering, when we're maybe facing the end of life? How do we want people to speak to us in terms of healthcare professionals? Um, how do we want our, our um, physical symptoms managed? Very, very important. Yes. Access to medicines like uh, morphine as painkiller, absolutely vital. But why is it vital? It's so that when we have our pain controlled, we can have those conversations with our loved ones. We can make the decisions we want to make um, for our families. Um, and I think it's that transformational ability that palliative care has. Um, and there's one value I think we talk about a lot, compassion. Yes. Uh, there's a, there's a, an equation people are talking about at the moment um, that compassion is awareness plus empathy plus action. And that equals compassion. And I think that's something that we see in the journey of palliative care. First of all, we need to be aware of it. But is there that connection? Is there that empathy? Are, are we identifying with the person affected and realizing that if that person is affected, I'm affected because I'm part of humanity? And then what is my response to that? Either as an, a member of the, the society, as a, as a leader in the community, um, as a healthcare professional, as a policymaker, as a politician, what is my response to that? And that is the compassion that is at the center of palliative care. I totally agree with you. I I think that palliative care has a role in being a model mm. to other healthcare movements or healthcare systems by imbibing, you know, to imbibe such values in terms of, you know, like I think when you experience uh, as a professional or even as a, you know, as any person who has something to contribute in palliative care, you understand that these nuances are so important when you deliver care isn't it, in terms of connections. I mean, uh, which other medical specialty speaks about connections or which medical specialty speaks about compassion? I think palliative care actually can lead the way for other moments. And in fact, we're seeing more, um, I suppose, policy documents, research that is telling us what, in a sense, as human beings we know. We want to be seen, we want to be valued, we want the things that are important to us important to the person who's wanting to care for me. And we want to have a voice and we want to have some influence on how that happens. There's um, a really interesting uh, movement called the Compassion Movement. Now, it, it's, it in some ways is recognizing what is there in many, many societies, but sometimes societies have changed, values have changed, things have fractured, and maybe palliative care is a tool we, by which we can rediscover it. And we can discover it for our healthcare workers. You and I, we teach medical students, we teach juniors about communication. Why do we do that? We do it because actually those healthcare professionals, they want to connect. That's why they came into to, to healthcare. But maybe they have got so busy on thinking of the treatment they need to do and the research, and you and I are researchers, research is important. But if they cannot communicate, if they cannot connect, one, the patient will have a much worse experience, but actually that healthcare worker will have a worse experience. And, you know, I can think of students we've taught that have said, this has transformed me. I will be a better doctor because of this. I wish I knew this when I was looking after my own family because it, 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 it touches us all. And I would have done things differently. So, so I think we, we, we actually have this capacity to transform in the way we teach uh, palliative care, in the way we practice palliative care, in the way that we, through palliative care, look at what it means to be human. Yeah. And I think palliative care itself, you know, as a concept and as a specialty itself, has evolved and transformed. Yeah, 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 for sure. Like, I mean, uh, even in our two, in the two decades that I have been in palliative care, 
when I look back and then when we used to focus more on, you know, people with cancer and their families, now it has just taken a tremendous leap forward, isn't it? For sure. And, and again, when I look globally, you can see that it starts in different places. It started within cancer yes. and pain control here in India. It started in, in, in Africa from the HIV um, pandemic. I think these global pandemics have the capacity to teach us something if we're willing to learn. That's the question. Something new that's, that's it's affecting us all is climate change and planetary health. And actually that compassion narrative is vital there. How does compassion impact how I treat myself, how I treat other people in my community, but also how I treat the, the, the world. And we're rediscovering some wisdom from indigenous communities, from you know ancient ways of thinking that have been, if you like, pushed to the side, and we're having to rediscover them very quickly. And we're seeing palliative care has a core role there. I think you saw that in Kerala during the floods and how the palliative care movement actually was a core part of the very human response. And I think palliative care has also been uh, really visible or you know, taken note of in that sense during the COVID sure. pandemic. Um, people have had experiences. I mean, we have seen mortality in a very different and uh, devastating way during the pandemic. And uh, palliative care has been mentioned strongly in all global forums. Um, what have your, uh, what are your thoughts about it? I mean, we, I know that we did a lot of teaching during we palliative did, yeah. care. We have seen and witnessed a lot of suffering during palliative care, yeah. during the COVID uh, pandemic. So, and uh, as a palliative care physician or as a palliative care doctor, we had different experiences as well. What have been your experiences? Uh, a couple of things. One is some of the settings which were most confident in their healthcare, you know, with the most developed health systems, in a sense, didn't know how to respond because the COVID-19 really questioned um, our meaning, you know, what, what gives life meaning? If we can't control it anymore, if we don't have the, the medications to, to stop an illness like COVID-19, what does that mean for us in the community? So I saw in, in countries like the UK, which, you know, had a devastating um, experience of the pandemic, quite bewilderment because they're, in a sense, used to having a healthcare answer to some of these questions. But I also saw healthcare workers struggle with that same journey. Um, there was an interesting uh, series of letters published between the early days of the pandemic, between a doctor in Italy and one in, in the US discussing, they were acute care doctors. And initially they said, our job is to push uh, mortality to the margin. That was the word they used. And they couldn't do that anymore. And what they said in the end was actually, it made them more conscious of their humanity. One of them even said, we're all palliative care doctors now. What they mean was they can't run away from that. Yes. Um, I remember right back to my early days of palliative care, feeling that I had not medically cared for my patient as well as I would like to. I, I didn't have the skills. And I went to talk to his family afterwards. And she said, thank you for caring for him. And I said, how did I care for your relative? I felt as though I had not controlled his breathlessness, a very difficult symptom. Well, she said, you, you, you came every day to see him. You asked about his family. He looked forward to your smile. I was just a young doctor. Looked forward to your smile. You always were there for him. And I think that sense of being there for people, even when you don't have uh, all the answers, yes. and you're walking alongside that presence and holding that presence, uh, again, you can describe it almost like a candle, and you're holding those places between fear and doubt and hope and despair. Those You're holding those places, not necessarily with all the answers, but saying we are there, we are going to do all we can to improve the quality of what's happening f for you, but most of all, we won't abandon it. But also very, you know, having this great focus or, you know, very strong focus on the balance of having a very good quality of symptom control, yeah. Yeah. isn't it? I mean, like, I think that balance between all these domains, yeah. you know, having a good symptom control, taking care of all the physical symptoms that a person has, but as well as looking into all those spiritual, mm -hmm. these emotional aspects, the mental health issues, which again came up really visibly, you know, uh, noted during the COVID pandemic. I mean, we saw so much of a surge of mental health issues. We saw, you know, the grief that came in, the cumulative yeah. grief due to the losses. These were all something that even for us, 
was a learning experience, isn't it? We had this network, didn't we, of, of, yeah. of, of um, delivering teaching and training, to, I think, to well over 2,000 people in 15 countries yes. during COVID. But we also had that network of teachers. Yes. And in that network, we shared quite deeply, didn't we, about the impact for us. And I think you're right, it has brought, brought to the fore some of the areas that were marginalized. Yes. Um, mental health being a key area that was marginalized. And I think together, if you take the principles of palliative care, of transformation, of dignity, of compassion, of holistic approaches, you can actually then start looking at some of these neglected areas or, or marginalized areas. Um, you can start listening to people like our, our tribal indigenous communities, our refugee communities. And I think, I think that's the other thing that palliative care is doing. I know in India, for example, here in Kerala, homelessness yes. and mental health has become a real focal point yes. for palliative care extension. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, as you would know, because I'm also a mental health professional, so being working in the community, looking after, see, that's what I learned from palliative care in the sense that how palliative care transformed in Kerala was going beyond, like I said, from cancer to HIV. I know we are taking care of any serious health-related suffering, mm -hmm. and we include chronic mental health issues in that, and we have programs which look into people who are, people and families, who are devastated, who have really, you know, uh, the family structure is shattered due to a chronic mental illness. And homelessness is one important aspect people do not really yeah. notice. Like, we always ask, you know, people who come with us, like, you know, when you go in your cars or, you know, vehicles in the road of Kerala or any part of India, you know, you do not really, that is actually a story, you know, you do not really see people who are wandering. Mm -hmm. You see wandering people, but they just kind of merge within the scene, isn't it? You don't really notice them. But if you really notice them, they have a story to say. Yeah. How did he come about on the roads? Where will he go to? Who's taking care of him? So homelessness with mental illness is an important aspect that we are looking into these days. And you've told me some powerful stories of uh, people who the families have been trying to care for them, but maybe they have been wondering, maybe they've even been falling into, I think there was a gentleman falling into a pond in the village. Yes. And in order to try and prevent that, he was being restrained. Yes. And that's so distressing. And I see this to other parts of the world too. But what you were able to do through the, the philosophy of palliative care applied in community mental health was actually control that symptom and allow that person then to not be restrained. That is, that is the learning. You know, I think that palliative care, that is exactly what I meant in terms of a philosophy that can be imbibed by any specialty. That, you know, how do you, you improve or improvise the way that you can care for people? And for mental health, I think the palliative care model has really opened window, you know, of hope, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of delivering care. But I, I just want to ask another aspect in terms of, because we know that, you know, when we talk about palliative care, it's not only these, we also have to have evidence because we are basically people who rely on signs and, you know, indicators. And I know that uh, the World Health Organization recently brought in some indicators in palliative care. Uh, can you give me your thoughts about it? So it's, it's an interesting journey to look at palliative care from that global policy perspective and, and, and then apply that. And of course, Kerala has been very, very active in influencing and changing global policy on things like access to pain control and things like models of, of care. What I see in, the, in this very recent document is a, a model, it's actually a little house, um, a model of uh, how to think about palliative care which has all those essential elements, service delivery, access to medicines, education and training. Yeah. Um, and, and those are still the key elements of the delivery of a model of palliative care with the patient and the family at the center. But it also adds evidence, as you say, as one of the building blocks. And then under, as a foundation, it adds um, some of the policies that you need, and that's why we need you know, to have our, our policy makers engaged. And I think Kerala has also been leading the way on that. But it also has empowered communities. Yes. And, and I think this, this is the biggest change of taking it from a very nice holistic model into actually something where the community, those affected, have a key role in that. There's also been some very interesting research over the years called the Quality of Death Index. It's run by The Economist and um, it uses a number of indicators. Again, it seemed to show initially high income countries doing much better. But I think we've learned better how to measure palliative care. The most recent indicator documents 
uh, I think it was 81 countries have been involved, um, are beginning to measure some of these softer aspects like compassion. I was fascinated to see that when you asked the caregivers what was important to them, number one was pain and symptom control. If you're in agony, there's nothing else you can yes, do. Yes, uh, There's nothing else you can do and, and, and you don't even feel like living. But underneath that was things like um, the cleanliness of where they're being cared for, the kindness of the people that were caring for them, having choices about where they were cared for. So I think this is also highlighting the importance of them listening to the community. But the other issue, and this is a big issue, is we can design all these, uh, these care uh, models, but sometimes it's uh, just impossible for people. It's impossible. And one of the things that make it impossible is out-of-pocket expenditure. And there's a very interesting piece of work recently from Malawi, which was looking to see whether palliative care can influence out-of-pocket expenditure. Now, this is huge in India. Um, people who actually are driven into poverty. Uh, palliative care sits within something called universal health care. And a tenant of universal health care should be access to quality care without financial ruin. Yes. And yet that's not the reality, is it? Every day we see financial ruin. So it's very interesting, isn't it? Can we actually measure whether giving people good choices and um, letting them determine what's important to them and also looking at the social component of that can palliative care influence that? And I think our evidence as practitioner is yes, yes, and we're now beginning to catch up with the research models to show that. And I think that's a very important area going forward. Mm -hmm. Maura, I know that you, uh, one of the important roles that you, you do now is being, a, uh, being a, a head of research in a network called Palchis, which looks into uh, providing palliative care in humanitarian aid settings. Uh, and you have immense experience, again, in very, very conflict-ridden areas where there are, you know, refugee, mm -hmm. uh, where there are refugees like North Uganda. And of course, you, I think you are very active in Gaza as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to hear more mm. about it. I think it's, it's almost if you, a natural extension from what we talked about. Where are the people on the margins? And um, increasingly, we've begun to realize and, and, and Things like the Kerala floods were one of those triggers. Things like the Ebola outbreaks, um, HIV we've talked about, of course now COVID, that there are people who are affected by these emergencies but carry on being affected for many years. So we formed this network to link together the humanitarian sector and the palliative care sector. Um, 1% of the world is estimated to be a displaced person last year. This year, estimated one in 88. So it, it's affecting so, so many people. The other thing is when people are displaced, they usually go to their next door country. Um, you know, there's a lot said about migration, a lot of fear about migration. The reality is they usually go either within their own country to a safer place, either because of a flood or an earthquake, um, or they go uh, fleeing from conflict that's becoming increasingly common. And that conflict may even be related to planetary health. Uh, we look at uh, what's happening in Pakistan right now the huge impact of the floods. And of course, that's linked very closely to climate change. And we're seeing that, that the most fragile parts of the world, um, and there's actually even a definition of what means to be a fragile setting, are the most affected by climate change, by conflict, um, and also by disease such as yes. pandemics. So we're beginning to try and pull together the expertise and try and make sure that these holistic principles are, are there right at the beginning of a humanitarian context and crisis, but they carry on afterwards. Um, I, I mean, the learning from the flood was very, very interesting, where these community networks of palliative care that were already on the ground with panchayats involved, with communities involved in Kerala, then were part of the core response to the floods and the ongoing response. And you've done, I know, some very interesting research looking at the mental health impact, but also what was important to people. And I think you showed that the children, for example, were concerned what happened to their pets and their, their, the toys that were important to them. So if we go to a place like Uganda, one million refugees are there at least, mostly from South Sudan, some from Congo. Um, that makes them one of the highest hosting refugee countries in the world. And, and what impresses me is that there's no bars to those. They're not in camps with a lock on the door, which sadly is the case in many countries. So there is some freedom of movement, but also the host population, uh, the people who are living in those areas, 
are living very, very rural and um, themselves have a lot of challenges. So what you're seeing there is an area where you can have 50% of the area is our refugees. And yet you're not seeing conflicts and problems between groups, which is, which is quite amazing. They, they are using a kind of public health, health system strengthening way of, of helping so that people are attending the same hospitals, the same clinics as the local people. I think that's very important. But we, uh, together, I think you were very involved in helping us design some work to look at what are the needs of people in that setting. And we're seeing, of course, the physical needs. We're seeing the needs for pain control, the need for uh, even being able to diagnose illnesses like pathology, access. But we're also seeing high levels of distress. There's a tool which you've pioneered here in Kerala called the Distress Thermometer, which just tells you something about that person's quality of life and distress, a global tool. And we've just done some work in northern Uganda showing very, very high levels of distress. Now, we have to investigate that further, and we're going to be doing that, looking at, for example, uh, community-grounded approaches, using photographs, using narratives, using qualitative stories, to really understand what is the nature of that distress. Um, and coming from that is, of course, just as we, uh, is the link between mental health and um, palliative care. Um, and I, I'll just tell you, a, you know, a story, a typical story, someone who was a teacher whose husband and son uh, were in the army who had both died in two separate conflicts. Um, they had eventually fled over the border from South Sudan because of um, the illness of now the leader of the family, the matriarch, and she had liver disease, which is very common there. And that liver disease, actually, the combination of the distress, the losses, multiple losses, the liver disease, she ended up looking as though she was going to die in one of the district hospitals. But she met the palliative care nurse there. Uh, they started looking at the medical problems, but also these holistic issues. And she was able to go back home. In fact, she said she's still alive three years later. She's now moved to the capital. Her family have got jobs. They've moved on. But what she told me was the palliative care team gave me hope at a time when I felt hopeless. You've asked me about Gaza. Now, Gaza... It's almost unimaginable to think of 15 years of a siege. Uh, I was there when COVID started. I actually traveled from India to Gaza. And my Gaza friend said, please tell the, tell the world if they want to know how to handle lockdowns. We've been doing it for many, many years. We'll give them advice. You know, incredibly uh, positive outlook About in many ways. But if you can imagine 15 years, those of us who have been involved, who've experienced COVID lockdowns, extend that to 15 years, affecting every part of your life with now high, high levels of mental health, maybe 50% of children showing suicidal ideation, for example, at times, um, with every area of your life restricted and controlled, and then you're living with a chronic illness in that setting. Very, very difficult. But what's been amazing for me is the welcome I have received, uh, you know, to my colleagues there who are so concerned about value and meaning and caring for their own people, um, especially in the midst of, of difficulty and trial. So the young medical students, for example, we teach them about communication, we talk to them about grief and loss, we teach them about uh, pain control. And one time I, I was doing an end of course evaluation and I said to them, what have you learned? And of course, they were telling us that Scottish people are the nicest in the planet. You know, they were being very, very uh, typical undergraduates. But they started to talk about what they saw in palliative care. And I said to them, you're telling me now about values. Please just shout out the values that you see. And they listed dignity and mercy and hope and love and justice, very important, and compassion. And, and I realized in one short week, we had connected into a society under unimaginable pressure and we had found something to make us uh, almost share our humanity. One young medical student said, when people see what is happening to us and care enough to come and work with us, it makes us feel more human. Isn't that interesting? So I think, I mean, that re again, I think I want to reiterate that, you know, palliative care is not confined only to a medical specialty. I think it has a much higher relevance, like I said, it probably not only in terms of healthcare, but in the current socio-political, uh, mm -hmm. what to say, scene yep. across the world. 
Uh, what, do you, what do you say? For sure. You know, what that young medical student was telling me in Gaza is that what connects us is our common humanity. And we're seeing that under pressure in so many places. We see it, yes, in Gaza, when, when there is a situation of such oppression and inequality happening over so many years. But we're seeing it in our countries. We're seeing it in different ways where we are kind of um, defining ourselves by who we are and who somebody else is not. You know, we're, we're increasingly defining ourselves. We are this and you're this. And I think what palliative care teaches us is in the end of the day, do these things matter? They don't. What matters is me as a human being, connecting to you as a human being at times in our lives, which are, are some of the most meaningful, the most difficult, but also the most precious. So I think more than ever, we should say to societies and, and, and settings, what is it that unites us? And what is it unites us in relation to our planet? Yeah, because we're, we have a choice. We had a choice in COVID-19. Were we going to become more selfish and hold on to things? Or were we going to share? And I think we saw both. We saw both. We saw uh, situations where vaccines, for example, were not shared equally. Um, that's been a, one of the big inequalities. But we also saw many, many acts of compassion. We saw many barriers come down. We saw people using innovative things like, uh, you know, using electronic means to communicate and to share, to even say goodbye to their relatives. So I think it showed us the best of humanity under pressure. And perhaps palliative care brings us right back to that. It's about our common suffering, our common humanity, and the compassion that we, we as individuals, but we as societies, and we as a global community, uh, need to remember, discover, uh, celebrate, develop to respond to the needs. And I think uh, it's only right, or you know, uh, to the point that uh, this year's World Hospice and Palliative Care Day has the theme of healing hearts and communities. I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic actually has uh, opened those kind of, you know, doors in terms of thinking differently. Yeah, Because has. I think as medical specialties, we kind of confine ourselves so much um, into very strict concrete borders, isn't it, of mm -hmm. science and research and, you know, very straight lines, you know, very straight, thick lines. But I think uh, we have to move beyond that. We have to push the boundaries and go beyond that and uh, develop, like you said, to reach out, to connect, and still hold on to that, you know, medical balance where we still give them good quality of life and uh, dignity while dying. Absolutely. And, and there's a series of little short vignettes called Humans of New York. I think you've, you, you've seen that. And I'm beginning to see there's humans of, of, of palliative care. Actually, Pallium India and Trivandrum has been developing that. And I think that what does it mean to be human? And what does it mean to see you as just as human as me, just as equal as me, just with the same um, core needs in your life and actually act with compassion? What does that mean? Yeah, I think there was a quote from an American doctor during the COVID pandemic of staying human, isn't it, during that suffering. Yeah. that you know how how all doctors should be palliative care doctors like you said and also to stay human during that mm -hmm. that very difficult time and to move through that pain barrier of wanting to run away from something to engaging with it to responding and then discovering more about our, our common humanity um, there's a phrase in palliative care it came from from kenya in fact that talks about adding life to days not just days to life so what does it mean to add life to days and just as I find in Gaza some of the most hospitable people on earth, uh, even palliative care has been translated into as kindness care. Isn't that lovely? Kindness care in the Arabic translation. Um, not just in Gaza, but because yeah, we talked about Yeah, I think in Malayalam also we call it sandunam. Uh -huh. So that is also, that means kindness similarly care. in terms of, so I think palliative care brings in such meaning in, like I said, you know, in all aspects of in language also, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so different. We are talking about how COVID-19 pandemic affected uh, everyone, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it also really um, made us aware or you know, really think about mortality mm -hmm. and suffering, isn't it? I mean, like, mm -hmm. death has never been so much on our face, uh, on everybody's. I mean, like, people were really so frightened, isn't it? Like, you know, even to go out or even take you know, I, I know of people who wouldn't even go out to the balconies mm -hmm. thinking that the virus would come floating in the air. So 
people had their own fears about how they would get affected. Um, so, but, and palliative care has, again, has uh, such a role, sure. not only in, you know, like from, uh, from knowing what a person is, like the diagnosis yeah. or improving the quality of life, but I think, I think our, we have a very definite or a significant role in terms of end of life care or yeah. even the discussion of death and dying. You're absolutely right. So many of our societies, I would maybe say some of the societies which have moved more down the biomedical models, almost see death as something that you prevent, uh, that you, you delay it if possible, but maybe even prevent. And I think what COVID-19 did and what palliative care does is remind us of our mortality uh, alongside our humanity, our human mortality. Now, what does that mean? It can mean fear. It can mean stigma. It can mean um, even more desperation to prevent or it can mean an understanding that, that how we treat people at the beginning and the end of life says something about our societies, about actually it's just as appropriate to prepare for the end of life and think about it, not just at that point, as it is to have a birth plan, you know, and to think about that. I actually also saw that some societies who maybe they're used to being around um, people who people who die, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing it, people are dying young, uh, they don't have the healthcare access, almost had more resources to approach it. But if we just take end of life care, it's such a precious time, it's the last time you spend with loved ones. It's such an important time to make sure that uh, things like pain is controlled, that people are not distressed. But I, I have a colleague who's written in the UK a book called Listen, and she's also talked about something called tender conversations. And one of the things I think we need to say to people is death is actually usually quite a quite a step-by-step -step process. It's not necessarily that it's going to be full of suffering and full of pain and full of distress. That for many people it's a it's a leave taking. It's a leave taking physically as we see the body begin to shut down and processes shut down. And of course, the skill of, of the clinicians there is to, to make sure that there's nothing we can do to, to reverse the physical symptoms, but there's everything we can do to support families, uh, to support the process, so that, that that can be as meaningful and gracious as possible, so that the loved ones can hold the hand and be there together. They can say the things that are important to them, that things like saying I'm sorry, reconnecting, building relationships, seeing priorities can happen. And perhaps we need to bring that into our conversations. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's also like, like you said how death is perceived. So I think uh, the clinical or the, the medical fraternity also perceives death as a failure, yeah. isn't it? Like uh, when somebody yeah. dies, someone with a chronic illness or even any illness dies, they perceive it as their own failure to cure them because cure is the ultimate success. So to gently let go, you know, for the physicians or for the medical professionals as yeah. well to know when to stop. There's something in Kerala I think has been talked about, allow natural death. Uh, rather than do not resuscitate. Of course, we must be good clinicians. We yeah. must make sure if there's something we can do that's going to make a difference, to improve yes. quality, to extend life, even in a palliative care mode, we still we do, should that. do that. Yeah. We must do that. But we shouldn't pretend that we're going to... Uh, life has 100% mortality. <laughs> we'll always have that. That is the only certainty. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually. And of course, palliative care extends into the grief and the loss period and, and how we adjust, uh, um, and how we support people on that journey of adjustment. But I think it is also important to say that one of the things we do in palliative care is come together at a very human time. Um, I remember we, we traveled together to Mizoram some years ago. And what I saw there was a bell rang when somebody died in that community, very tight communities. And immediately everybody had a role to play. They were coming out and handling this, the coordinating side of it, the food side of it, the, 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 the arrangements for funerals. It was seen as a community thing. Um, in Scotland, they have a, a, a program called Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief. Now, if you're Scottish, you yes. know that that's kind of a, a phrase we say, good grief, when something happens. They also brought in something called Two Absent Friends. It picks up one of our national poets. But what that was saying was, 
what do we do in our societies to remember? I see in India here, you do things on the anniversary yes. of someone dying. You have, have prayers, you have rituals, or you have a coming together. I've been at concerts, for example, yeah. celebrating, remembering, commemorating. I think that's something very important in, in the society here, but has maybe been forgotten in other places. So how do we uh, have appropriate rituals? Or we bring them back in again to help people through those periods. But how do we make death part of life? Yes, part that's of true. Life? Like it's got implications in the, like you said, spiritual domain and also. And I think it's also how we manage death or uh, end of life of a person also is linked to the out-of-pocket expenditures that you had correctly pointed out, especially in a country like India. So how the uh, intensive care units function and how they are used when a person clearly will not benefit from such interventions. And when do you make the right decision or help the family yeah. to make a decision that, no, this is the way to go and this is not the right way to do. So I think it's upon the clinicians as well to make that change. You've brought up such an important issue that one of the things we need to be doing as a society, but definitely also as, as clinical uh, colleagues, is helping people make appropriate decisions. And if we don't have the communication skills, then the rest of our medicine falls apart. And you, we, we've seen this. We've seen people who have spent every penny in ICU such that the, it affects the whole impact for their families, for the education, for even the marriage and so on of their families, without knowing that that treatment was futile. It was never going to actually help. And we're, we're almost subjecting people to a medicalized, unpleasant, uh, lonely death, you know, in an ICU, in an ICU. attached to tubes and so on, with no hope of recovery, because we can't have those conversations. And I, I've seen in India, very encouraged to see in India, the legal provision changing, so that there is good now provision in law to have those appropriate conversations and to recognize the ethical issues at the end of life and to have that discussion about what's important. Is it important for somebody to spend an extra four or five weeks in hospital and get that extra treatment? Would they prefer that four or five weeks home with their grandchildren round about them? Who makes a choice? Who makes a choice? And we don't just do something because we can do it. Um, we actually have a conversation about should we do it? And the patient and the family must be part of that conversation. conversation. But of course, that also means if someone should get a treatment, still in India, still in many parts of the world, one of the greatest health inequalities existing to this day, despite all the developments of palliative care, is access to pain control. So, you know, it's not about giving up on treatments, it's actually saying what is it that people have a right to. Um, still, I think uh, more than 90% of the world's morphine is used in about seven or eight countries. And I go to many places in the world where they simply have paracetamol uh, if they have pain control, uh, if they have severe pain. In India, Kerala has, has done so much to make morphine available. And the palliative care movement has transformed that. It becomes ordinary now. In my experience in, in, in Uganda, for example, this is now normal uh, to prescribe um, oral morphine for pain control. But in many parts of the world, it's simply not there. I mean, access to morphine has improved across India as well. When Kerala took it lead, yeah, it has improved, improved and you can see our neighboring states and North India also getting more access to morphine. But of course, there's definitely yeah. the, you know, majority of the population, especially the poor and the deprived, do not get access to pain. For sure. Medicines. It's good to see that the, the, the central government and the state governments have begun to see this as an issue, uh, which was not there 20 years ago, which is really important. So coming back to our discussion on death and dying, I think when we talk about clinicians, you know, changing their perspective about how to manage. I think the start should be also a discussion about death openly in the society. And I have seen there's been a lot of uh, efforts from colleagues and friends across India. They, they have these death cafes mm -hmm. where people talk about it, talk about uh, death and dying in a much more open way because we usually do not Death is a taboo word, isn't it? You do not talk about death. That's why it's, it's as if that it does not happen to me, yeah. it happens mm -hmm. to somebody else. So, and when it happens to you, then you just crumble under that thing. So I think that's also one of the points that needs to be highlighted that these, these topics should be discussed so that the, so the communities that we speak about or the societies that we, mm -hmm. we are referring to also have a role in this. 
And that is wider than healthcare, isn't it? Yes, that's, yes. that's part of uh, part of media, part of social environments, and you know. <sighs> As I say, going back in Scotland, we have this song. I think you also sing it, "Old Lang Syne." Yes. It's sung all over the world. It's written by our national poet, and actually, that's talking about the connections between people, and that's been uh, how people have brought back into society. Because I'm sure we used to talk about these things. Remember the poet John Donne? Uh, he says, "Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee." That when one no man is an island, when what affects me yes. affects someone else. And perhaps we've moved quite far down, thinking that actually it's about me and my family. It's an autonomy-driven, individualistic society. And perhaps palliative care allows us to move back again. Uh, maybe countries like India, many of the countries in Africa and Palestine, can teach also about what it means to be yeah, a collectivist. Uh, absolutely, collectivist, community oriented But still, we need to make sure we are discussing life and death and all its glory and its joys and also its, its pains and its challenges. So I think it's important to also remember that palliative care and being human is something that brings laughter and joy as well as tears and sorrow. And it's that whole package that makes us human. Thank you very much, Moira. You're very welcome. Thank you.